Um, I, I would like to thank uh, IT at Cork for organizing the Tech Talk series, and specifically to Vivian, who is the uh, events coordinator in IT at Cork, and she's uh, pulling the levers in the background and making all of this happen. Um, I, I, uh, uh, I sit on the uh, events committee of IT at Cork and help them with events, and I've asked them to allow uh, a number of technical events to go ahead. So we, in June, I think it was, we did an IPv6 one and this morning uh, we're doing one in the area of the tools behind cybersecurity. And I have to admit, uh, it is a, a purely selfish reason why I've asked for this particular talk to happen. Um, in, in Cloud Kicks, we get a lot of requests from customers that are confused around the issues that we're going to discuss this morning. And I want to improve my own understanding in this area. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the talk from Vincent who volunteered, volunteered in quotation marks, uh, but I really thank him for giving us his time this morning and I'm looking forward to a really interesting talk. Uh, we will have question and answers at the end. If you want to ask a question uh, during the event, that's cool, um, but we probably will deal with anything complicated at the end. If, if it's something simple, we may deal with it during the talk. Vincent, over to you. Thanks very much. Okay. So I'll just share my screen. Okay, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to today, today's talk. Um, the, the talk is about hashes, keys, and certificates, and and uh, it's an IT at Cork technical talk and um, I, my, my name is Vincent Ryan. I'm a senior lecturer in computer science at CIT and I lead up the masters in, uh, uh, in, in cyber security that we run at CIT. So um, I'm going to start by talking about cryptography. And cryptography is the name actually comes from it's the science and, and study of secret, so secret crypto and thing is graphic in, 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 in ancient Greek. So that's, that's where it, the, the name actually comes from. So crypto and graphy. Uh, we've also got the idea of a cipher. Um, a cipher is an algorithm really. So whereby plain text and the plain text is the original intelligible message. So this, it's the original message that is, we say, in English, and that's transformed to ciphertext, which is the transformed message by a process called encryption. Encryption uses a key. So I have a diagram on the next slide which uh, talks about that. I'll just make my my, um, my screen a bit, bit bigger now. So, um, the, the, it's governed by a process but by, by a key. The key is essentially a number. Um, it's typically, you know, 128 bits in size. 128 bits would be 16 bytes, essentially. And those bytes, you know, would, would, would be, you know, fairly random numbers. So they wouldn't be just kind of letters or anything like that. So um, the, the, then, then we get the plain text back by a process called decryption. So decryption is used to get the plain text back. So I have a diagram here which kind of explains that. So there on the left side, I've got the plain text and the plain text is fed into the into encryption and we get out the ciphertext. And the ciphertext that we actually get out is governed by a key. So the key is fed into the encryption process here. And the key, as we say, is maybe a 128 bit um, if okay and I'll talk about that in a minute so then we've got on the other side then we've got the cipher text and the cipher text essentially is uh, fed into the decryption process so this is the decryption the same key is fed in so the very same key and we get back the the plain text so that's essentially con conventional cryptography so we, we've got plain text we've got an encryption uh, using a key, the key is we'll, we'll say 128 bits in size, and we get out the ciphertext. So what happens on the left-hand side here is done by we'll say Alice. So Alice wants to send a message to Bob. So in in cryptography, we usually call uh, A Alice and B Bob, 
and then we got other names as well, like C for Carl, D for Dave, etc. But just here, let's talk about Alice and Bob. So Alice is here on the left side, and Alice has plain text which she wishes to send to Bob securely. So she takes the plain text, she encrypts it using the key, she gets the ciphertext and sends the ciphertext to Bob. Bob then takes that ciphertext and decrypts it using the key to get the plain text back. Okay, so now, so while it's in transit between Alice and Bob, it is secure because if anyone intercepts it, they can just see essentially um, ciphertext, which is, which is unintelligible to them. They need the key to get it back. Now, the problem here is how do Alice and Bob share the key? So that's that's a bit of a, an, an issue here, and we'll see how how that actually we'll talk about that how that happens in a minute. So um, yeah, let's talk about it now. So so when Alice wants to send a message to Bob, she encrypts the message using the key K, and Bob used the same key K to decrypt the message, or or maybe just a simple function of it. But let's say Bob uses the same key K to decrypt the message. So, and as I've said there, the problem is how do Alice and Bob communicate K to each other? Um, and that's called the key distribution problem. So, um, let's go and talk about the main conventional ciphers. So, the, in terms of the main conventional ciphers, we've got AES, which is the main one, really. It, it is like the, the, main, the main, main one that's in use. When I talk about ciphers here, I'm talking about what's in the yellow, in the orange bit there. So both the encryption and the decryption. So AES is the main one that's in use. And there are three flavors of AES. There's 128-bit, 192-bit, and the 256-bit versions. So AES stands for Advanced Encryption Standard. And it is, it, it, it is um, approved by the NIST in the States. There's used to be before AES, not any longer. Its key size is way too short. It uses a 56-bit key, so it's not secure. Um, triple DES, then we've got Triple DES is still used. There, there are a number of flavors of Triple DES. Uh, there's a and RC4, RC4 is not really used any longer. Um, yeah. Now that's conventional cryptography. And now I, I just want to talk about public key cryptography. Um, so with public key cryptography, each user has two keys. So the user is two, they have a public key, which I call PU, which is published and a private key PR, which is kept secret. So the public key is published. It's um, you, you have to assume that your public key is known by the entire world and your private key is known only to you if, you, if you're a public key cryptography user. So you, you, your public key is published. It's known to everyone. Your private key is kept secret. The keys are the inverses of each other. That means that if you encrypt something with your public key, it must be decrypted with your private key. Okay, so it's not that if you encrypt something with your public key, it's decrypted with the public key. No, no. It's if you encrypt with the public key, it's decrypted with the private key. And vice versa. If you encrypt using the private key, it's decrypted using the public key. So um, the, the, the keys are the inverse of each other. And knowing the public key does not reveal the private key, even though they are related. They, they, there's, a, there's a relationship between them. When they're being generated, they're usually generated at the same time. So there is a relationship between them, but they're, they are put together in such a way that if you know the public key, you don't, it, it will, that will not reveal the private key. So now let's suppose Alice wants to send an encrypted message to Bob. So what Alice does is the A here looks up B, P U B, Bob's public key. So it gets Bob's public key and encrypts the message using Bob's public key. Okay, so Alice gets Bob's public key, which is published, it's known to everyone in the world, and encrypts the message using Bob's public key. 
Now, only Bob can decrypt that using his private key. So Bob is the only one who can actually decrypt it using his private key. So if Alice uh, sends a message to Bob, if someone is in between, is um, intercepts the message, they can't decrypt the message because they need Bob's private key to decrypt the message. So th that's that that's that kind of solves the, the the key distribution problem. And similarly, if if the message is encrypted using Bob's private key (PRB), it can only be decrypted decrypted using his public key. So if if it's actually encrypted using the private key, then it can only be decrypted using his public key. Now you might say, well, what good is that? Because you know everyone knows his or her public key. Well, we'll see that that actually is useful when we are when we are talking about signing signing messages in a minute. So. Um, here's the situation. In in this case here, we are the plain text is encrypted with Bob's public key, PUB, um, to get the ciphertext, and the ciphertext is decrypted using Bob's private key, PRB, to get the plain text back. So again, here this is Alice. Alice here on this side. Alice wants to send the plain text, uh, this particular plain text, to Bob securely. So Alice looks up Bob's public key, gets gets the Bob's public key, encrypts the message, the the the, the plain text using Bob's public key, gets the ciphertext, and sends the ciphertext to Bob. Bob then can decrypt that ciphertext using his private key, and Bob is the only one in the world who knows his private key. So while the ciphertext is in transit between Alice, Alice on the left side, and Bob here. If someone intercepts it, they can't they can't decrypt it because they need they need Bob's private key in order to be able to decrypt it. So you'd say that's fairly secure. Um, you just need to get the public key, encrypt with the public key, and send the message across. But the problem with public key cryptography in general is is that it is slow. Okay, it's a lot slower than 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 the uh, conventional cryptography. So um, we need to use both actually, because for uh, messages of any decent size, um, the, the the public key ciphers are just too slow. So what what we what we do typically is we we take a, a key for a, a conventional cryptographic algorithm, which would only be two, we'll say 128 bits. And we encrypt the key using, say, Bob's public key. So it's a small quantity. It's only 128 bits. We send that over to Bob then. And then Alice knows the key, the 128 bits. And Bob decrypts what you send. So Bob gets 128 bits as well. So now both sides know the conventional key. And both sides uh, can communicate using the conventional key. So that's typically what public key cryptography is used for. See, you're you're only con you're only encrypting a small quantity. You're only encrypting 128 or 256 bits, which is a very small. You know, that's say 16 bytes or or um, 32 bytes. So that's a relatively small quantity. So so you know that can happen fairly quickly. Um, we can also use public key cryptography in the other way for signing, as it's called. So if we use it for signing a message, you uh, this is Alice here. So Alice can sign the message using her private key. So she can encrypt it using her private key and send the ciphertext to over to Bob. Now, this isn't really giving Bob any security uh, uh, or any, it isn't giving the ciphertext any security because it can be decrypted with Alice's public key. So everyone in the world knows Alice's public key. So you know the ciphertext is not secure, but it can be verified. However, the signature can be verified by decrypting with Alice's um, public key. And if if it if you get back to plain text, then it verifies okay. So that's kind kind of um, you know kind of a quick introduction to to signing. But I'll talk more about signing in a minute. So there are the two methods that that we use. So. The main public key ciphers in use are RSA, Elliptic Curve, and El Gamal. Uh, RSA has the bulk of the market by, by a long way. 
Uh, elliptic curve is certainly catching up a lot. Um, RSA um, is it's a, it's a it's a cipher that is based. Its security is based upon the fact that it is difficult to factor a very large number. Um, elliptic curve is based on the elliptic curve discrete log problem and Elgamal is based upon the discrete log problem. But let's just fix with the RSA there. RSA, is its security is based upon the fact that it's difficult to factorize a, a very large number. If we can factor very large numbers quickly, then RSA dies, essentially. RSA dies, you know. So, you know, in RSA, we're talking about a 2048 bits size or a 4096 bit size. So we're talking about those sizes for security right now. But um, if, if quantum computers ever get to the stage where they can be readily and easily usable, then all of those three ciphers actually die. Um, and there, so there, there are some developments right now in coming up with a, a, a quantum resistant public key cipher. And, and that's in place right now. That that's that's going on. It'll it takes it's 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 in about year three right now, and it'll take another two years or so to before one is decided upon. And it's being managed by the NIST in the states, so that if and when um, quantum computers become readily available, we will have a cipher that everyone can use uh, it, 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 that everyone can use to quickly and readily. So the, the NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, is, is running that competition right now, and they're at a phase three of it, where they've they've developed they've brought it down to, I think it's four main ciphers for for general encryption. So um, that's that's cryptography in general. So hash functions then. Uh, a hash, a hash function is different to cryptography. So with, with a hash function, we take, um, the purpose of it is to, is to take a, a, a message, we'll say M, which is equivalent to our plain text, you could say, hash it. So we run it through the capital H there and we get out a hash value, which is fixed in size. <clears throat> so H is the, small H is the fingerprint or the hash value, capital H is the hash function itself, and M is the message that we're actually hashing. Um, so any, even a small change in M should produce a different H value. So if you change M slightly, you're going to get a different H value. And it provides us with what we call integrity. Integrity is the assurance of, of no change. So when, oh yeah, let me go to the diagram. So this is what happens here. We get our message, which is our message in, in you know, whatever we're, we're, we're sending. We hash it and we get out a message digest. And the message digest is just a, a number and it, its size is, it depends on, on which hash function we use. But say, for instance, MD, MD5 uses 128 bits, uh, SHA1 uses 160 bits, and then we got the SHA384 uh, uses 384 bits, 525 five, five, uses 512 bits, etc. Basically, the, the longer the better, really. Um, the, the Like SHA-1 isn't really used anymore, MD5 isn't really used much anymore uh, because, the, because the hash values that they produce are, are too small. There are other slight issues with the algorithms as well. But we, we take our message, we hash it, and we get out a message digest. Um, the process is non-reversible. It's not possible to go from the hash value back to the original message. And the main hash functions are MD5, not recommended, SHA1, not recommended. And then we got all these ones here, SHA224 <clears throat> gives a 224-bit hash, uh, 256 gives a 256-bit hash, etc. You can see the rest of them there. And then there's also SHA3, 224, 256, 384, 512, which is the most modern one. Those SHA algorithms are, are all already approved by the NIST. The NIST, the, the, that's that's putting together the, the quantum resistance cipher. 
So next, digital signature. Before I go to a digital signature, I might just do a quick uh, demo. So if I come over here, let's see my screen, yeah. So if I make this a little bit bigger, so if I, if I create a small file here, so echo um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, say, and put that into a file called small file dot text. Say. So just creating a small file here. Um, I can, I can end, so I can, I can cut the small file to see what's in it. And, and you can see A, B, C, D, F, G is in it. It's a small file. I can encrypt it using a, a process known as GPD, GPG, sorry, um, dash C to encrypt small file dot text. Okay, it's going to ask me for a password. I'm going to supply secret as the password. Okay, and, and now if I run ls now, I can see that I have small file.txt, but I've also got small file.txt.gpg. Okay, so I'll, I'll remove the small file, the small file.txt now. Okay, so now I've just got the, the uh, small file.txt.gpg, which is totally, um, which is, is, is totally cipher text. So if I try to cat that, um, just going to see like that there, you know, that, that's that's essentially what I get. So that's that's the encrypted um, small file dot text. Now I can get it back by using GPD G dash D small file dot text. If I do that, it'll put it up up onto the screen. So I'm going to I'm going to put it into small file dot text. So that'll put the output into small file dot text. I need to supply the, the cipher. Okay. Okay, and now, now I've decrypted, I've got small file dot text back. You can see there, ABCDFG is back. Okay, so that's just a very quick um, encryption, decryption. Now, now I know now there that I used, um, a, 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 say, like a password to, to, like secret there to, to do the encryption, but that is actually, that's actually hashed to a key size inside in GPG itself. So then if I look at um, the small file dot text and hash it, so I can do md5 sum small file dot text. Okay. And you can see here, this is the hash. So that, that's what I get in, in the hash there by just using md5. I can, I can use other hashing algorithms as well, like say sha3, um, it for some, that's another one, small file.txt. And now look at the size of the hash. The hash is much, much bigger. That, that's produced from, from small file.txt. Um, now, if, if I change small file.txt slightly, say if I echo, we'll say just an X maybe, and append it to small file.txt. Oh, I need to echo it. Let's see what's in small file.txt now. And it's you can see there's there's an X at the end. And if I um, say MD5 sum it again, I'm going to get a different number. So you can see here what I'm getting this time as opposed to what I got up here. So, uh, you know, you just make a small change in your, in, in what you're hashing and you get a totally different number. So it's a quick, okay. So the next thing then is a, a digital signature. And in terms of getting a digital signature, this is essentially what, what we do when we're signing something. So let's suppose uh, we want to sign uh, this message here. And we are S, we are a server, say, we, we, want, we want to sign the message. What we do is we hash the message first of all, so we, we get the message digest. Now this message digest is unique to the message. Um, you know, you, you, you can't, you, you won't get collisions as they're called here. You won't get two different messages with the same message digest. Then you take that and encrypt it with your private key. So you take the message digest and encrypt. Now the message digest is small. 
it's you know like you know maybe 256 bits in size that would be say 32 bytes you know it's 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 a small quantity so we're using public key cryptography here to encrypt it with the private key but what what we're what we're encrypting is small so it is so that will make it quite quick so we encrypt the message digest with our with our private key and that gives us the digital signature now the digital signature depends on two things it depends on the message because it the message so it just depends on the message and it also depends on who signs it because it's signed with the private key of of s the private key remember that we've got a public key and a private key so that's how the the message the digital signature is generated generally we take our message we hash it get the message digest and then we encrypt the message digest using our private key not our public key now our private key and this then is how the message is verified. So basically what you do here is you take the message and the digital signature and you send them to someone. Now, they might be encrypted before you send them or they, they might not, but typically they, they, they would be, but let, let's... ...sealed by someone who wants to verify the signature. This is their goal here. They want to make sure that the signature verifies. So they have the message, they have the dig digital signature, and what they do then is they they hash the message to get message digest one. They take the digital signature and go backwards. So they take the digital signature and essentially decrypt it with the server's public key. And everybody knows the server's public key. The public the server's public key is, 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 is widely known. It's a public key. So they take the server's public key, decrypt the digital signature, and they get another message digest. And if these two are equal, if message digest one equals message digest two, then the signature verifies. Then essentially it verifies, okay, then, then, then yeah, this is a digital signature for this message and for this particular message. And it was signed by the server's, um, by the, by the server's private key. So that's how signature verification takes place. It's essentially equivalent to meeting in the middle here uh, in terms of the signature verification. Because we go in this direction, we take the message, we hash it, and then we take the digital signature and we go backwards here. We decrypt it with the public key. And what we're getting here, it should, it should equal what we're, what we're getting from the, from the message. Okay, so that's signature verification. Um, so we've seen public key cryptography, we've seen conventional cryptography, we've seen hashing, um, we've, seen, we've seen digital signatures. Now we've got the idea of a certificate and the certificate essentially deals with um, here, when, 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 when you get Bob's or the server's public key here, how can you be sure that it actually belongs to the server, the, the public key that you're getting? I know it's published and it's out there, but how can you be sure that this public key you're getting actually belongs to the server? So this is where a certificate comes in. So a certificate, we by certificate, we usually mean a public key certificate. So it's a it's a public key certificate. It's a, it certifies that a public key belongs to someone or to some entity. It just simply certifies that, that the, a public key a public key we're talking about here now belongs to someone or to some entity. So we're, the certificate gives us confidence that the public key that we, we have belongs to whoever we think it belongs to. So this is what a certificate looks like. Now this is, you know, um, a, a, a very short overview of what a certificate looks like. There are a lot of other fields in certificates in general, and those other fields are described by the X. 509 standard but in general a, a certificate has the following it, it has an owner and the owner is the person that owns the certificate so essentially this is certifying a public key so this is the owner of the public key this is the public key itself so the, the we're certifying that that this particular public key is owned by this particular person or entity and uh, it has a, an expiry date the expiry date is when the certificate, the certificate itself expires. It doesn't mean that the public key no longer belongs to the owner. It just means 
that the certificate itself has expired and it also has a signature. Now the signature at the bottom, it, it says they're signed by a CA, signed by a CA. So it's signed by a cert, CA is a certifying authority, a certifying authority. And this is a body which essentially signs certificates for us. Okay, so it's a body that signs certificates for us and um, they're, so it's signed by their, using their private key and we usually have their public keys to verify the signature. So when you get a certificate like that, that says that a particular public key is owned by a particular entity, there's a, a signature on it and the signature you, you you would be typically able to verify that signature using the public key of the CA because typically you would have the public key of the CA and we'll see an example of that uh, at the end. Okay, now let's just have a look here at um, passwords and password storage in general. So password, um, password storage this is essentially dealing with how, how passwords are stored, say, in a database. Um, you know, let's suppose you're logging on to, we'll say, your email, you know, um, you suppose Okay, username John there, we've got a password secret. And in the password table, in the, in the password table, we've got username and we've got the password stored in the clear. Now, clearly that's not, um, that's not a good idea. Um, if, if, if someone, you know, manages to steal the password table, they've got a, a list of all of the passwords for everyone that's using, using your system. So, you know, clearly it's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not, not good to, to do that. So we don't typically store passwords in the clear like, like that. We don't typically do it. So the second way is to store a hashed password. So here, John's uh, here we got John as the username again and the password, the secret. Now here, in this way, we don't actually store secret at all. We, we don't actually store secret in the password table. What we're storing instead is a hash of secret. So in this case here, MD5 of secret is that number there. So I've just taken MD5 as an example here in this instance, because it's, you know, the, the, pass, the hash value is smaller. So what's stored here is the hash of secret, which is stored in the in the password file, in the password table. So now when John comes to log in, John, you know, John has asked for his username, he supplies his username, John. Um, then he's asked for his password and he supplies secret. Now what happens is that secret is hashed, the password he, he supplies is hashed, and it is compared with what is stored in the password file. The hash, uh, the hash of the password is, is compared to what's stored in the password file. And if they equal, if they're equal, then John is allowed to log in. Okay, so secret is never stored. Just John logs in, it supplies the username John, supplies the password secret. Secret is hashed um, and it's compared to what's stored in the password file. So clearly that's a lot better than storing passwords in the clear. Um, but, but this, a, a lot of organizations use, use this uh, method of storing passwords and attackers are wise to it. So when attackers get a password table like this, what they typically do is they use what's known as a rainbow table to find the password. So a rainbow table is essentially, you know, rainbow tables can be a size, you know, 10, 20, 30 gigs even in size. And what they are is they're lots and lots of um, dictionary words and dictionary words with 
you know, a zero one after them and maybe dictionary words with at uh, an, an A change to an at symbol or uh, an E change to a tree or, or, or you know, whatever small changes that, that you can make to password to, to words in, in dictionaries. So essentially there are words that are in dictionaries with, with changes made to them and even words in dictionaries, maybe two one after the other. And they are um, then they 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 those rainbow tables are readily available to attackers and to everyone. You can you can download them yourself. You can look up, Google them and get them yourself. But the attackers the attacker then who would have got the password file would be able to take this quantity here, the one beginning with DD, and find it in the rainbow table, and that would give. The password essentially that would that would give out the password which is secret so you know unless you have a really good complex password you you won't um and a long password as well you, you know it, it won't be um safe against this type of attack if the organization suppose you're logging into an, an organization maybe it's a, a retailer somebody that's selling something they ask you to create a username and the password and if they're storing the password like this um, the password is not really secure. The third way then is to use a salt. And the salt is just a random quantity that's stored with each password. So, so it does a different salt with, with every user. So John here has this particular salt. Um, other users have a different salt. And what happens is, is that the salt is added to the password. So we take secret. We add the salt to it maybe at the end, and that's that's hashed. Okay, so and we get out that quantity there, and this is the quantity that's stored in the password table. So we, we take this the password, we add the salt to it, uh, and then that's hashed, and the hash of it is what's stored in the in the password table. Now, um, a pre-prepared rainbow table isn't going to work because the salts are different for every password. The salt is, is, is a random string, but it's different for every password here. It's stored in the, in the password file. Like, so even, so if an attacker manages to download or get the password table, um, they will get the salts, um, but, but they won't have a rainbow table for th that, this particular salt. So that, that makes the reversing of the password much, much more difficult. The reversing of the, of the, the stored password anyway. So what happens here in terms of John, when, when John logs in, um, John has to supply his name, supply his, his password. Then um, what happens is then the system looks up his name in the user table, says, yeah, John is there, this is his salt. It takes the salt, appends it to the password as in this example here, and that's MD5 then, as in this example, and we get out this quantity. And we compare that quantity then with what's stored here. And if it's equal to what's stored here, then John is allowed to log in. But again, the password secret is never actually stored. So this is a much better way of um, storing hash passwords, but there are better, other better ways as well. Like, so for instance, you can use uh, S-crypt or B-crypt or B -P -D BMK, I think it's called, I can't remember the exact name, but there are a number of ciphers you can use for, for storing hash passwords, but using a salt is definitely the way to go. Okay, so to finish up, I wanted to just go over how TLS works. Um, in, in TLS is what HTTPS essentially. So when you go to a HTTPS site, what exactly is happening in terms of the cryptography? Oops. Um, just need to go back there. Okay. Oh, it looks like, okay. It looks like I'm gonna to have to do it without, um, okay. Let's go back to here, so. So, um, this is a quick overview of TLS or SSL or HTTPS. So essentially, th this is the client, this is your browser here. 
and you say, I want to secure a session to the, to the server. The server is, say, a web server, and the web server sends down their public key certificate. Okay, so their pub, this is the certificate now that says this particular public key belongs to this server. Okay, so then what happens is the server's public key certificate was signed by a certifying authority. We say very sign. Very key is in the client's browser. Now it's signed by very sign's private key, and the server here is paid for that. So the the, the client. Uh, verifies the signature in the public and it, if it verifies okay then the client has the server's public key so now the client has the server's public key which is pus so the, the public key cert went down and it was verified it was signed by a certifying authority and the certifying authorities uh, public key is in the browser okay so next then the client invents a session key this would be like say uh, 128 bits maybe for aes say 120 bits, using a pseudo random number generator so it uses a random number generator to invent a random trips using this server's public key, which which the in, got it in a, in a cert to get what we call a digital envelope. DE is a digital envelope. So the digital envelope is the encryption of the session for this particular, and it's done using the server's public key. Okay, so then the and the digital envelope is sent to the server. Now it is encrypted with the server's public key. So the server decrypts it with his or its private key, PRS, and gets out the session key. So the server gets the session key now. So now the client knows the session key because the client invented it. The server knows the session key because the server just got it by decrypting the digital envelope using its private key. It's more the session key now. So now they both have an encrypted session using using KS. They can they can encrypt messages going in both directions from the client to the server, serve the client using the session um, for, the, for the remainder of that particular session. That's TLS simplified in, in many ways, but it shows how a number of the items in that we've talked about there, how the, the, the certificate, how the signing is, is involved, how the public key is involved, the public key cryptography, and how the symmetric, these conventional cryptography, cr conventional cryptography is involved here, because we're, we're using the session key to encrypt the messages going between client and server. Okay, and that's more or less it. That's more or less where I hope to be. Yeah. So, Vincent. yeah, that's... Vincent, yeah. thanks very much. That that was fantastic. Vincent, there was a question during the um, uh, during the talk. Uh, where where, where, okay, Jerry, where yeah. yeah, where does the public key come from? So I think people are wondering about how to generate uh, how to generate uh, key, key pairs. Yeah. Would you would you address that for a second, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. So say for instance, um, in RSA, the public key is put together by um, essentially, essentially, if you want to, if, if you want to invent a, 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 a key pair, you are, your system will invent some random numbers of a particular size. Those random numbers will undergo, um, will go through a particular process and that process will, will give out the public and the private key. So you invent random numbers, they have to be fairly big they, they, they need to be large numbers. They need to be like 1,024 bits in size. Um, but you know, like your software would do that. And that will then go through a process which will give out both. both. It'll, like it has to give out both. They are related to each other. So it'll give out both the public and the private key. 
Yeah, and I, 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 am I correct in saying that a Windows server or a Linux server both have the ability to generate key pairs, private and public key pairs? That's a, that's a function of the operating system if, if it's needed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so, um, right, the... the uh, yeah, they definitely have, yeah. Yeah, we, we have two people looking for uh, a, a copy of the recording afterwards, so I think that will be available on IT at Cork's website, so you can, you can, you can rest assured on that. Um, uh, uh, I said at the start that I was very selfish in asking for this talk, um, Vincent. Um, it's a, it's a topic I grapple with and I struggle with, so, so it's fantastic to have somebody who's an expert in the area. Um, can, I, um, can, I give you, uh, uh, can I give you a feedback of what I think I heard and tell me where I got it wrong? Okay, so if it, I, I think this might help other people okay, as well. So, so my, my, what I was doing when you, were, when you were speaking is I was taking notes and I separated out in the notes, I separated out the tools and then the application of the tools. So um, in cryptography, you, you mentioned two types of cryptography, conventional and public key. And uh, then you spoke about hashes and you brought in the concept of salt for a hash, okay? So my understanding is that that's your toolbox. Yeah. yeah. If, you're, if you're involved in cryptography, if you're involved in cybersecurity, you have a relatively small toolbox and what I'm trying to do personally, I'm on a journey, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand um, conventional cryptography. Uh, you, we all did it in school. You know, you had these things that you could turn and the letter A became the letter F and whatever. So that's uh, uh, conventional cryptography. And I understand the concept of um, mm -hmm. sending around the keys because if you watch any World War II movie, okay, you know, when they, when they get the submarine, the first thing they do is they look for the book of keys, okay, so that they can uh, re reverse the, the, the codes, okay. And public key cryptography, uh, there's crazy math in that, okay, in the sense that you, you, um, you, know, you, can, you can decipher something with a public key, but the public key can't be used to find the private key, and I get that. So, so th those, those are the tools, and there's a lot of math and a lot of understanding oh, no. in that. Yeah. Am I getting it right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so the, the, mm. if, if you want there to... There is really, yeah. There's a... Yeah. Okay, so, so, so those are the tools. Now, what I then did was, uh, but it's a relatively small number of tools. Now, the way I look at it personally is if, if you look at those tools, you need to study them, you need to be good at the math, you need to get you know, an understanding, or, or at least you need to learn off how they work. Okay, so that's fine. But there's really only four. There's conventional cryptography, there's public key cryptography, and then you've got hashes, and maybe the fourth one is applying a salt to a hash. But it's only four, so you only have to learn four concepts. Mm -hmm. where, where it becomes really interesting for me then is you take these four theoretical concepts, two of them have to do with secrecy and two of them hashes and, and salts have to do with integrity and you mix them up. So you take a problem in, um, you take a problem in, uh, in cybersecurity and you say, okay, these are the tools that are available to me. Now, every single one of us uh, uses TLS uh, every day in, on, our, on our web browsers, HTTPS. And the brilliant thing about, uh, and it, it's, yeah. my, my guess is TLS is probably the most complicated use of, because it uses everything. It uses, um, uh, it, it uses digital signatures and certificates, which are based on the underlying technologies as well. So it's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And yet we use it every day. So uh, let, let me summarize. Yeah. Uh, so this is where I'm going to get totally lost now, Vincent. But let me summarize the bits of the stuff that build mm -hmm. up TLS. And I might ask you to explain TLS a little bit more to us again. But um, the first thing is the certificate authorities. They're burned into our browsers. So VeriSign was the one that you used there. So our browser already knows about VeriSign. Um, so it, 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 is yeah. that correct? Yeah. 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 Um, so it, it uses... Um, it does, it does, yeah. it does indeed. Okay, so it uses digital signatures, it uses digital signatures to create certificates. So where I, where I and then it uses a certificate authority, yeah. which is burned into your browser. So your browser knows, okay, this is why if you create, if you go to a server and create your own uh, public and private key pair, you can do encryption. And when you do encryption, um, 
uh, using your own public private key, you won't get the green bar or whatever, the green little lot, because you're not using a public certificate authority. So I'm going to come to a question. Um, the, right, if, if we look at, um, if we look at TLS, let's encrypt as free and you can pay a thousand dollars, okay, to get yourself a certificate, you know, from a certificate authority. Can you explain to me the difference? Why is one a thousand dollars and why is one free? <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose that the reason why, well, okay, if, if you go back, say, maybe five, six years ago, there was, there was no Let's Encrypt. And at that stage, then you, you just had to go and pay your money to the, to, to the certifying authorities that, that charge you. But uh, Let's Encrypt came along then and they, they provided certificates for, for free, essentially. And uh, yeah, so they, they is essentially gonna, you know, it took a lot of the market. Now, a lot of organizations will still just go with, 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 with the very signs, the global signs, et, et cetera, the, the, the main CAs. But let's encrypt it is there as an option and it's a free option so it's it, you know it, it's um it, it works as far as i know um you, you know like so there's yeah. Yeah. there i i don't really know if there's any difference between using let's encrypt it and save global sign very sign i know there's an issue there now all right with um say old android phones that they can't they, they they won't be able to deal with um certificates that are coming from let's encrypt um encrypted w w websites you know um that that's a bit of an issue okay um but but you know so because uh, they, they haven't been updated really but um you know, you know the, the the let let's encrypt is fine for what it does you know it's it's, it's it works fine yeah I, I i just noticed actually that ambrose asked the exact same question that i just asked so i think we've we've answered that one uh for you um, the, the um, Vincent, uh, a couple of days ago, I was sitting at my laptop, and uh, if anybody does what I'm about to say, just be careful. Um, I, I typed in by accident, uh, Google, I was typing in google.ie, and because I hit the R next to the E, I ended up typing in um, g o g g l r dot i r. Um, and I went to a landing page. If you want to try it, fine, but don't type in anything because I don't know what's there. But uh, it, it, it was somebody okay. obviously pretending to be google.ie. Um, so it didn't have an SSL cert. Um, but I suppose if I, you know, IR, I assume is Iran. I'm not sure. But I, I presume. Yeah, IR is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I presume that somebody in Iran, okay, is trying to capture traffic or trying to understand something. But um, I presume with, with the free cert, I could register, if I was in Iran, I could use Let's Encrypt to create an, it wasn't a, H, a, TT, a HTTPS site, it was HTTP, but I, yeah, could go, yeah. I could go a little bit further maybe with the, um, with, the, with, the, with the chicanery, with the trickery, if I actually use Let's Encrypt, because now I could make it a HTTPS and it would look more genuine. Um, but that is, it would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but maybe with yeah, the certificate, I, I remember with the certificate authorities, we have to send in copies of passports of the directors of the company. So I suppose yeah. that's where the that's where the value comes in. Okay. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot more. Yeah, there's, there's a lot more checking going on that it, it, that you are who you say you are. You know. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, the the, uh, the 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 other the, the other point as well uh, that I just wanted to ask about is. These techniques of hashes and cryptography, I think in particular hashes are used in areas that we might not expect at all. I believe blockchain uses hashes extensively. Is, is that correct, Vincent? As far as it, yeah, yeah, did you? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so there are applications. Um, you, you use the word integrity for hashes. Um, yeah, yeah, integrity is just, it's a service really that it means that, um, you know, where it's available, you, you, you can be sure that what Alice sent to Bob is what Bob received. Yeah. Whatever Alice sent was what, you know, exactly what Bob received. So that's what it, it, it ensures really. All right. And that's the basis for, for, for blockchain as well. So, so Vincent, I'd like to thank you. Uh, I, I, let me see if we have any other questions on the, if anybody wants to type in a question quickly before we let Vincent get back to his, his normal day. 
Um, Vivian will put up the, the, the slides. The, the, I presume it'll be a recorded presentation on IT at Cork. Um, Vincent, thank you very much. Uh, okay, I, no. learned, I learned a lot. I still have a lot to study. And thanks to Vivian and IT at Cork for organizing the event. Okay. We're getting okay. some thank yous thanks. coming in. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Vincent, and thanks, Vivian. Yeah. All, all the best, everybody. Okay. Have a great day. Bye.